Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Salam sejahtera, selamat pagi, good morning, ohayo gozaimasu, good afternoon, konnichiwa and good evening everyone. Professor Miki Sugimura, Faculty of Human Sciences, Sofia University, Japan. Professor Dr. Khairul Anwar Mastur, Dean, School of Liberal Studies, Citra UKM, University Kebangsaan Malaysia. Dr. Fifi Hasnida Saikim, the, uh, the Asian International Mobility for Students, AIMS, Executive Secretary, University Malaysia, Sabah, Malaysia, and Professor Dr. Kinichi Namai, School of International Liberal Studies, Wasida University, Japan, Honorable Guests, uh, Associate Professor uh, Dr. Adlina, Honorable Guests and Participants from across the world who join us today. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wabarakatuh. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the second UKM Global webinar series, supported by Toshiba International Foundation with the theme, The Internationalization Experience of Higher Education Institutions in Japan and Malaysia. I'm Hafiz Rasul Muhammad from University Kebangsaan Malaysia International Relations Center, UKM Global, UKM, and I will be your MC for today's webinar. Our honorable guests, the focus of this webinar will be on sharing of insights and point of views of various distinct speakers addressing the need for transdisciplinary understanding to be incorporated into the education system. The sustainable, the sustainable development goals, for example, cuts across various fields of studies and is applicable to all walks of life. Transdisciplinary understanding needs to strongly be explored, especially in the process of creating global citizens. These generations need to understand issues that go beyond boundaries and how global cooperation is important in solving global issues. All right, ladies and gentlemen, to begin today's seminar, I would like to introduce our moderator for today's webinar. Associate Professor Dr. Adlina Asmawi. Well, let us get to know her a bit. Associate Professor Dr. Adlina Asmawi is currently the head for Department of Language and Literacy Education. She was the Deputy Dean of Undergraduate Studies and the Quality Manager of the Faculty of Education, University of Malaya from 2014 to 2017. She holds a PhD in Professional Development of Teachers TESOL and Instructional Technology from Melbourne Graduate School of Education, University of Melbourne, Australia. Dr. Adina has worked with various international universities on creative thinking and creative teaching for higher education. She is currently working on developing English language resources for select urban poor students and volunteers and, and interdisciplinary one with dentistry and computer science faculties on an app to prevent smoking initiation among Malaysian children. 
Dr. Adina has a few awards on her belt, such as the best in teaching at, at the 2017 University of Malaya Excellent Award, won herself a silver medal at Citrex 2019 and in April 2019, two platinum medals at the Innovation and Design Expo, UM for her Pearl Frame Pedagogy of English Language Acquisition Among Urban Poor Learners, and reach frame professional development of teachers through community engagement. She is the VIWA 2019's Outstanding Women, Women in Humanities and Social Sciences, and in 2020. She added another Platinum Medal from Insight 2020 for her team's innovation made, MAID in Malaysia. She is recipient of Melbourne Graduate School International Alumni Award 2020. Okay, here is Associate Professor Dr. Adlina. The screen is yours, Doctor. Thank you very much for the lovely introduction, Hafiz. And thank you very much, UKM Global, for having me here this morning. Hello, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Towards greater years together, that is their tagline. All right. Prof. Cairo, Professor Miki, Professor Ken, Dr. Fifi, Associate Professor Dr. Abdul Latif Ahmad, Director of UKM Global. University representatives from Malaysia and across the world. Ladies and gentlemen, I heard that the DVC of Student Affairs of UKM may also be here, here today, this morning, yeah? All right, welcome. Socrates said, I am a citizen not um, of Athens or Greece, but of the world. So grounded in that, we have four distinguished panelists here today, two from Land of the Rising Sun, Japan, one from Land Below the Wind, Sabah, one from National University of Malaysia, and Without much ado, let me introduce our first panelist, Professor Miki. Professor Miki Sugimura is a professor of comparative and international education, faculty of human sciences at Sofia University in Japan. This university was founded in 1913, by the way, and he was, she was vice president for global academic affairs from 2014 to 2021. She is a member of Japanese National Commission for UNESCO president of Japan Comparative Education Society, a board member of World Council of Comparative Education Societies. She's also a visiting professor at the United Nations University Institute for the Advanced Study of Sustainability and a board member of Toshiba International Foundation. She writes on policies, equity for excellence, um, cross-border higher education for international student mobility, cross-border migration and human security and peace building. Her research interests lie in knowledge management, uh, global leadership, subjective well-being. And I have to mention here, her research projects include a 12 country study on the learning mechanism of global leadership competencies. Wow. So a round of applause to Prof. Miki for being here. So I'm going to here uh, allow her to speak on Transdisciplinary education and the growth of global citizens. The floor is yours, Prof. Miki. Thank you very much for your wonderful and very kind introduction to me, uh, Dr. Adelina. First of all, thank you very much for inviting me to such a very, very precious opportunity to this uh, the UK Global uh, UK Global Center. I appreciate the, all the friends here in Malaysia and also very happy to meet many people in the world. So please share my screen first. Thank you. Can you share my screen? Right. Can you share my screen? Can we start? Yes, yes we can. Yes, we can Thank see you very screen much. now. Yes. Yeah. I appreciate the UK um, uh, Global Office especially our University of Year and UKM has a wonderful relationship always. So I appreciate your kind invitation here. Today, my topic is the transdisciplinary education and the growth of global citizens. And first of all, I'd like to talk about why the transdisciplinary education is very important uh, for the sustainable development in the world. And next one, I'd like to introduce some case studies of my university because we have a uh, several good projects with UKM and some Malaysian universities, but not only Malaysia, but also the many partner universities in the world. So I'd like to introduce those kind of case. And finally, 
I would like to point out some issues or challenging points in implementation of transdisciplinary education, as well as the significance of transdisciplinary approach. As you know, so many people now have been discussing on the SDGs, and especially SDGs goal 4.7 pointed out the importance of education for sustainable development and global citizenship. This very, very short, but very tense uh, phrase includes many important norms which we must face at the higher education sector. Education 2030 framework of action also pointed out no one left behind. This means is a kind of the very important law in inclusion and equity. The UNESCO has published one important report last year how we can face this uh, very complicated situation in COVID-19. And in this report, they propose some ideas or they suggest how we can create a new normal and a new traditional learning and teaching style at the many in education sectors, especially the higher education should take a very important role. Last May, the UNESCO also had another very big conference focusing on the ESD, Education for Sustainable Development. Varying declaration was proposed at this conference and many people reconfirmed again the importance of education for sustainable development. Knowledge, skills, values, and attitudes, not only getting the some knowledge, we need to create or nurture of the new young but not only young, uh, many peoples can contribute to the sustain the future society. And uh, at that time, education should be taking a very important role. UNESCO also pointed out some a kind of process of how we can create this kind of learning. Societal transformation, this is a, a kind of goal but the, through learning outcomes, learning content, pedagogy and learning environment, those are kind of the circulation model uh, should be very important when we promote this kind of activities of ESD. When we look back at the rational research on ESD at the higher education, of course, we have uh, several points to be highlighted. From the social and economic factors, university taking an important role and responsibility for transformation from knowledge-based society to a creation-based society and contribute to the SDGs and realize uh, some important uh, points to uh, resolve the, some global issues through ESD for 2030. Of course, each institute have an accountability and transparency of higher education uh, responsibility. And of course, we cannot forget this point, the pedagogical factor equitable and qualitative learning and creating, evaluating the 21st century skills. These skills include critical thinking, creativity, and communication skills. Those points are very related to the today's topic is transdisciplinary education and how we can create the global student. So now I'm very honored to be introduced some case studies based on the, my university's project. As already Dr. Adelina kindly introduced Sophia, our Sophia University was established in the 1913, about 108 years ago. But since 1949, Sophia has been promoting the English-based education. But this means not just teaching in English, but also we want to focus on the, how we can create a kind of the students for the future's generation with some a competency. So this Faculty of Liberal Arts has uh, several structures. The first year, the hone or your communication and analytic skills, and uh, students can take some uh, sub uh, disciplinaries from the sophomore year. So this is a kind of the one of the model of Sophia's liberal arts education. Core program include reading skills, sequence of composition course, public speaking course, and critical thinking, and uh, as already said, from the sophomore students, they can take the three majors from the comparative culture, international business and economics, and the social studies. This is a one of the style and our model 
of liberal arts, which create a kind of transdisciplinary education since 1949. But at this moment, we are now expanding our this the mission through some another English teach program. A green science and green engineering. This is under the science of technology faculty, which started in the 2012. And also at the graduate level, we added some courses based on the English-based program. This is a graduate course and the global studies or global environmental studies also are added to our the basement of liberal arts education. And now we are doing some project from many various the internationalized program. One of them is the ASEAN International Mobility Forum program. Today, I'm very happy to meet the, some uh, persons who are responsible for this project from the Malaysian side. And very fortunately, Sophia was selected for one of the universities of Japan's AIMS program. And Sophia University, we call it the SAMES, Sophia AIMS program, which started in 2013. The government budget has already ended at the end of 2018, but we are, of course, still continuing this transdisciplinary human development education program aiming for harmonized diversity. We are now connecting with UKM in Malaysia and also some universities from Indonesia, Philippines, and Thailand. Uh, we are more focusing on the transdisciplinary based on the field research and uh, some professors beyond the, some faculty members cooperate together to create this program. Another project focusing on the Latin America because our society are now expanding more and Sophia has a Portuguese or Spanish department. So that's why we have a several partner in the Latin America also. This is another LAP program also focusing on the mobility issues or human migration issues to pursue the coexistence program. So in parallel, the same program, we are also expanding our this, the transdisciplinary approach more. This also the national government supported program ended in the last year, but still, of course, we can continue and follow up this program more. And now we are moving forward another program. Besides the AMS program, based on the AMS program, we quite recently started our the Bangkok in Thailand office called the Sophia Global Education and Discovery. This office is now the corporatized by the university because we need to sustain this uh, a kind of the organization to create a new program based on the Southeast Asia. Not only Thai, but also the some Southeast Asia or beyond Southeast Asia, we can create uh, several programs there. And the uh, new program of undergraduate and also online service learning uh, now it has been already started. Finally, I'd like to point out some quality assurance issues. So this is a Sophia Ames, as I already told you, and UKM is one of the very good partner for us, but the transdisciplinary approach has been conducted so far. But of course, the COVID-19 suspended our the human mobility and the students now have been a lot of problems to study abroad. But, but so that's why we try to create a new program, virtual program based on the Bangkok office. Uh, last September, again, the UKM, I appreciate your university, you cooperated us uh, so much. And not only UKM, those are some uh, Philippine University or Thailand University cooperate together to make this wonderful program. More than 180 students from four countries got together to talk about how we can create a more uh, kind of resilience or resilient society in this Asia. And the students through this program, they can try to learn how we can lot of perspective from this transdisciplinary approach. So Sophia, Global Education Discovery now has been expanding their project more. This is another challenging from our side which is COIL, Collaborative Online International Learning. I know many Malaysian University, maybe including UKM, has already started this kind of wonderful challenge because since last year, 
the many in-person classes suspended, but we are now finally trying to start this COIL project. Of course, very beginning stage, now you can see the slides, the, between the US government and the Japanese government negotiate together to create this program. And uh, Sophia University has again selected for one of the COIL project university. And we cooperate together with Ochanomi's University or University of Shizuoka. So it's private, national and public university cooperate together with the 10 American partner universities. This project requires us to promote the student mobility, but now we cannot send or accept our students, but still we are continuing this project. For example, the last year, one of our professor of faculty of nursing, she created a wonderful program through virtual learning. Those universities, especially the nursing students, uh, had a wonderful learning about the uh, mutual uh, perspective or mutual understanding through the international health education. Usually the nursing students have a lot of difficulties because their curriculum are very tight. And of course they need to get a kind of certificate at the end of the fourth graders. So that's why many nursing students have quite few opportunities to study abroad, even before the COVID-19. But now finally they can get the chance to talk about those people with directly, and they are very happy to uh, enjoy this international atmosphere. Besides it, we are also expanding this uh, COIL project, focusing on some refugee people in the, some refugee camps, or we are the Jesuit Catholic University. So based on the Catholic mission, we like to expand our network on focusing on the human security and multicultural coexistence. This is another example of which are developing in the Thai or some student mobility or outbound uh, issues. Uh, there are also another case studies based on our program. So if you, or if we can create more this kind of virtual learning through and forward our transdisciplinary education to create the global citizens might be very, very interesting, I think. And last year, finally, we had uh, one more thing, very, very challenging program, but called the SOPIA Program for Sustainable Futures, also again, the English taught undergraduate program. Uh, last uh, September, we welcomed the first batch students. And uh, just uh, last week, we welcomed the second batch students, education department, sociology, journalism, global studies, economic and uh, in management, sixth department now started the bachelor program. Finally, I'd like to point out some issues and point, because even if we can expand this kind of international program to pursue the transdisciplinary approach, we need to always check and assure the quality and the student learning outcome should be very important. Now, as already uh, Professor Dr. Adolin already introduced. Uh, so we are now joining the OECD project, uh, which is called is the how we can creativity or critical thinking approach from the transdisciplinary programs. So 21st century skills or global competency should be considered in this the development of this program. Of course, as also I want to point out, the 21st century skills is very, very westernized the concept. So that's why how we can create more original one or based on the other concept should be added in this point. But anyway, if we can create these kind of topics to be very appreciated. Finally, I would like to sum up the point. And now we are facing on the very, very difficult time, but we need to use this unusual opportunity to create a new blended and hybrid education and inter or transdisciplinary learning should be one of the very key point for us to develop our further development in the higher education sector. So thank you very much for your kind attention and very happy to discuss this point with you. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.
Arigato gozaimasu, Prof. Yuki. Thank you so much for contextualizing transdisciplinary education within Sofia University in Tokyo. So we see here the role and responsibility of higher education in realizing the transformation from a knowledge-based society um, to a creation-based society through international transdisciplinary education. So, for, so moving along, we'll take questions right after everybody has uh, spoken. Okay, all right. From moving from um, a university founded in 1913, we now move to a university founded in 1970. We have the National University of Malaysia. All right, I'm delighted to introduce our second panelist, Professor Dr. Cairo Anwar Mastor, the Dean of School of Liberal Studies, Chitra UKM, Malaysia. So Prof. Cairo graduated from University of Bangsa, Malaysia, the National University of Malaysia, uh, George Washington University, Washington DC, USA, and the University of New South Wales, Australia, respectively. His interests in research are in two major areas, assessment and development. And a global citizen himself, he has been globe trotting across continents, I see here. So he was a visiting scholar at Washington um, State University, Pullman, USA, Humboldt University, Berlin, Germany. Um, he was Fulbright Visiting Scholar at University of Illinois in 2008, uh, a university, uh, um, another visiting professor at the University of Lausanne 2010, and at University of Oregon in 2015. All right, uh, check this out. He was awarded Fellowship for Advanced Research Award by Mosti in 2007. William J. Fulbright Scholarship Award in 20, uh, 2008. Um, he was appointed as one of the experts in personality research by the European Association of Personality Psychology, EAPP, in Rome in 2009. And he was also expert in conceptualization and measurement of personality states, one of the experts. Um, that is as recent as September this year, yeah, Prof. Cairo. So without much ado, here to speak on the need for transdisciplinary understanding in education and high impact education. Let's welcome Prof. Cairo. Take it away, Prof. Cairo. Thank you very much, uh, Associate Professor Dr. Adelina Asmawi, for a good introduction of me. Uh, I really appreciate that. Uh, let, uh, can I share my screen? Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, very good morning. Can you see my slide? Yes, we can, Prof. Okay, thank you. Um, honorable uh, panelists, uh, Prof. Nick Miki, Prof. Ken, and Dr. Fifi of uh, UMS, uh, and uh, uh, I will, I'm from UKM. I'm very uh, pleased to uh, be in this forum uh, entitled Transdisciplinary Education and Gross Global Citizen. So I'm from Pusat Chitra or School of Liberal Studies at UKM. Um, my uh, presentation would be uh, slightly different because my focusing, uh, I would be focusing more on this uh, transdisciplinary education uh, run at the UKM as uh, a case study. So I begin with uh, what is a global citizen and what is transdisciplinary education and how do we run uh, TE in Malaysia? And how does TE help develop and grow the global citizen? And finally, the conclusion. So uh, I hope um, sharing this from the UKM Malaysia perspective, we can enhance our knowledge and practices to, uh, to grow our global citizen in this region. Now, as uh, I get it from the Oxford University uh, website. A global citizen is someone who is aware of and understands the wider world and their place in it. They take an active role in their community and work with others to make our planet miss more peaceful, sustainable, and fairer. So that is uh, one uh, definition of concept of a global citizen. Then the aim of global citizen is to encourage young people to develop their knowledge 
skills and values so that they engage with the world and a belief that we can all make a difference. And uh, education for global citizenship as a framework for learning, reaching beyond university campus to the wider community. So education does not limit itself within the uh, university campus, but it go beyond to serve the community and the society. And this can be promoted in class through the interdisciplinary education. So this is just an uh, introduction what is global citizen from our perspective. And uh, moving on to what is a transdisciplinary education, as we know, it is an education that bring integration of different discipline in harmonious manner. So this is what we do at UKM to construct a new knowledge uh, and uplift the learner to higher domains of cognitive abilities and sustain knowledge and skill. So we know that disciplinary is just one single discipline of knowledge and the multidisciplinary is about getting together all knowledges and interdisciplinary where they have their connection together but transdisciplinary is even more. They have all this, those integration and combination of different knowledge. So how does trans disciplinary education contributes towards global citizens. So we run uh, this kind of transdisciplinary education, especially at UKM, uh, in a, a different, slightly different, different manner. So we have uh, this School of Liberal Studies, uh, Citra at UKM. Uh, we choose uh, liberal uh, in, the, in the English uh, uh, English liberal as liberal, but we cannot translate to direct into Malay, so we Citra. Citra, to a certain extent, uh, represent that multidisciplinary and transdisciplinary. So we began in 1983 and moved on to um, restructuring of the Center for General Studies to Center for Liberal Studies in 2014. And the latest one was that we were upgraded to a school of liberal studies in 2020. So that is very recent um, development of the school where we are given the responsibility to uh, run this uh, transdisciplinary education as our uh, focus of the uh, of focus of the school. So this is our building, Citra in UKM. You are much welcome to visit our school. Professor Kennedy has been there for some time before, and uh, I hope Prof. Mickey will have also opportunity to be with us. Now, uh, we began by looking at this, the, the, the complex nature of the world, that, that we have an ever-changing demand of the work, employability, and so forth. So what we did in our case for School of Liberal Studies we do. Uh, we did a benchmarking, a benchmarking with other institution in in the world. We uh, I remember we began by looking into twenty two school of liberal studies all over the globe, and we engage with the internal and external stakeholder get get their information about the need of the graduates by the employees out there. And sorry, Prof. Kairul. Yes. I'm sorry, Prof. Kairul. <laughs> Um, we can't see the full slide at this point. It's uh, sort of cropped. Could you um, either reshare, unshare, and reshare? Okay. Can we just uh, try that for a, for a bit? Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll just do that again. Yeah. Sorry. Okay, let's just uh, reshare that and see whether it works. Uh, let me see. How about this one? Can you see this one? Okay, do you mind changing to um, slide share? Yep, uh, just a second. Okay. Does it work? Mm -mm, not yet. Okay, this is fine. Thank okay. you so much. All right, please proceed. Sorry. All right, no problem. This is the circle one. Can you see the circle one? So, yes, yes, we can. Uh, this time we can. Thank you. Sorry for this uh, technical uh, uh, mistake a bit. Okay, uh, we engage our uh, school with internal and external stakeholders. 
the government agencies and the uh, private agencies, the business, the businesses, and other school uh, that run these liberal studies uh, to ensure to explore actually what are those domains of knowledge that considered as transdisciplinary. And we did several um, workshops uh, engaging with uh, the, the, the people out there to come up with our new uh, so-called curriculum for the, trans, the transdisciplinary uh, education. So we also met our transdisciplinary education with the SDGs. So our nature of trans uh, education, transdisciplinary education is future focus, ready curriculum, and we employ the DOFA approach, which is dynamic, organic, uh, flexible, and agile. And also we, um, we adopt this jukebox approach that inclusive, that inclusivity imply that transdisciplinary uh, cutting across the border of knowledge of different disciplines. Trans, cross discipline, across a faculty. So we actually en engage our uh, faculty members from other schools in UKM to develop courses that can be catered by all students of different backgrounds. And also cross institution. We currently have our MOU with uh, University of uh, Technology Mara, our uh, neighboring university, Yossi Malaya, and also University of Monash, Monash University in, in Malaysia. So we, we actually send our students there for uh, getting extra, uh, to, to get uh, knowledge from, uh, from their respective uh, university partners. And uh, students actually in our uh, transdisciplinary education, we encourage students to develop their own curriculum uh, area of concentration so that's, that it meets their uh, self-interest, self-goal and career. And we also um, have this kind of uh, mixed uh, mode where we have two U and two I or two years at university, uh, two years at industry or three years at university and one year at industry. This is meant to, to, to help students to get exposure to the uh, aspiration learning at the work-based uh, learning program. So this is our um, Bachelor of Science in Liberal Studies structure. It's, uh, it's a case study of transdisciplinary education. That in the first year, students uh, get uh, to set up for their uh, courses uh, that is uh, community-based learning uh, orientation and the second year would be more on interdisciplinary approach whereby students take courses from different faculties according to their choice and in the third and the fourth year where they go out from the campus and serve the community or being attached to the industry or the non-governmental agencies to further their knowledge and their on, ongoing experience, uh, practicing their knowledge back home uh, back in the campus, bringing up that into the society. So, so this is uh, this is uh, quite a, a novel approach for a Bachelor of Science in Liberal Studies. So we have a a, a, a kind of related campus related to area, related to community, and related to, to career. So this is an, uh, a process of development of the so-called uh, global citizen within the, the, the national context. Uh, these are the example of where students go out to serve the community. Um, this was in uh, Kampong Alo. I'm, I'm not sure where it is, but um, uh, one of my colleagues um, uh, run this kind of program, and it is part of this uh, program of the Bachelor of Liberal Studies. So by uh, strategies, we have this uh, in teaching and learning and research, uh, we have collaboration uh, with the academic as well, uh, with the industry and government agencies. And uh, do, what, what does students uh, go for the learning process? 
they have face-to-face -face learning, which is 25%, assessment 5%, and the rest is more of the self-directed learning that uh, constitute their time during their community and career-related uh, period, period of learning. And we have also research with the academician as well as the industry uh, partners. So uh, we have a very specific uh, flow of implementation of the transdisciplinary education by Citra. We have guidelines for students to uh, choose their concentration. Um, and also we have guidelines for the advisory committee. We have mentor mentee system and advisory committee that include people from the industry and the uh, community agencies and also the program committee. So with all this, we uh, uh, help students to develop their own program uh, so that they can tailor to their needs and their interests. And recently, uh, the Ministry of Higher Education has launched this experiential learning and competency-based education landscape as a way forward for public universities' uh, transdisciplinary education. So this is known as Excel. Uh, this is still in the uh, process of um, awareness. Uh, we haven't started yet, but this is the the uh, Excel uh, program that will be launched uh, in the very near future about uh, involving experiential learning and competency-based education landscape for the project for to produce a uh, student with innovation, entrepreneurship, uh, creativity, and change maker. So in short, uh, the TE helped us and help our students to contribute to solving environmental issues, solving economic issues, solving social and political issues, solving human and health issues uh, in, in, uh, in, uh, in a very uh, introductory way. Of course, they have to go into uh, further collaboration uh, at the world, uh, at the global uh, level. So uh, in conclusion, I can say that transdisciplinary education allows the openness of students to experience learning in the real world. And we collaborate with uh, out of university partners like industry. And the concept of transdisciplinary education acknowledge the responsibility in addressing relevant problems in social, economic, and political and environmental domains. And the dynamic nature of the, the TE itself opens to the new opportunities and improvement in the future. So I think uh, that's how uh, what we can share from UKM perspective about uh, trans transdisciplinary education how, and how it relates to developing the global citizen. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. And uh, uh, that's all about me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. Cairo. It's, it's great to see that UKM has started moving in the transdisciplinary education direction across faculties as well as across university partners. Congratulations. I, I'm pleased to also understand that um, students are now creating their own concentration area of learning, and the goal is HIEPS, Higher Impact Education Practices, and not just any notion of transdisciplinary education, but one which is focused on that particular goal, yeah, HIEP. Yes. All right. So from the peninsula Malaysia, we cross the South China Sea to the land below the wind to University of Malaysia Sabah. Our third panelist is Dr. Fifi Hasnida Saikim. She is not just an academic uh, from uh, University of Malaysia Sabah. She is the executive secretary for Malaysia Asian International Mobility for Students program AIMS under the Ministry of Higher Education Malaysia. She graduated with a Bachelor of Science with Honours, Science and Aquatic Resource Management from University of Malaysia, Sarawak. She has a Master's in Science and Nature Tourism from University of Malaysia, Sabah, 
and she has a PhD in tourism from the College of Business, Law and Governance from James Cook University, Northern Queensland, Australia. She has worked as a consultant at WWF Malaysia, the Sabah branch, and as a community outreach coordinator at SOS Rhino Berhad. So Dr. Fifi will be talking about uh, global citizens, lifelong learning, as well as the preparation for global citizenship. So take it away, Dr. Fifi. Okay, thank you very much, Madam Moderator. Um, let me share my screen. Okay. Assalamualaikum and a very good morning to everyone, especially to the organizer, UKM Global, for inviting me to share my, what we call, experience with this transdisciplinary education because from my background itself, I came from a science and aquatic resource management and suddenly jumped into a new world of nature tourism and then jump out again and jump in into the community world. So I will share about how transdisciplinary educations can have a, some sort of impact in creating and developing a global citizens for especially for our young leaders today. So these are my tips contents that I would like to share with, uh, with everyone about, about global citizens, what is global citizen. I think Dr. Professor Mickey and um, Prof Professor Herul have already mentioned about what this global citizen is all about and why it is so relevant and so important nowadays and what is the connections between global citizens with lifelong learning and how to prepare our global citizens through transdisciplinary educations. So as, as been mentioned by Professor Mickey and Professor Hyrule about global citizens. Yes, global citizen is someone who is aware of and understands the wider world and the place in it. Meaning to say that, for example, we as Malaysian, we just, uh, it doesn't mean that we have only have to tackle about what is going on in Malaysia. As a global citizen, we need also to understand what is happening at outside Malaysia, the situations beside apart from Malaysia, so what is happening around us, what can we contribute, what can we play, um, you know, as a role, an active role in that particular community uh, to help each other so that to make our planet more peaceful, sustainable and fairer to everyone, not only just for Malaysians, but also any other of our colleagues and friends around the world. So when we talk about global citizens and SDGs, we talk about SDG4. What is SDG4? SDG4 is actually to ensure inclusivity and quality educations for everyone. Okay, for everyone, not only from Malaysia, from Japan, from Thailand, from Philippines, but everyone, underdeveloped, developed or developing countries. This is so that we can promote a lifelong learning, which includes global citizenships as one of its target under the SDG4. And by 2030, we're looking from today, this year's 2021, so we're looking for uh, about nine more years to go to target that all uh, that everyone have, you know, a quality education, okay, to ensure that everyone have a quality education that can help to promote upgraded skills, sustainable development, and so that we can strive in this um, agile world. Well, what is agile world is that the world is moving, okay, it's dynamic, it's always changing, so do our um, uh, so do our in the, uh, what you said the skills that needed uh, for this community, and at the end of the day, what we can contribute to the to that community, and the key facts that when we talk about global citizens is that the society with a global perspective, we're thinking about not only for ourselves but other community around the world and we maintain lifelong learning. We continue to develop our skill, to upgrade our skill so that it is uh, fit in to the agile world, the moving world, keep on changing world. Know how to compete and collaborate 
we know how to compete with each other with other other people around the world but in a healthy manner in a fairer manner and collaborations appreciate diversity and multi diversity the multi disciplinary meaning to say we acknowledge we appreciate the diversity because we are uh, living in a world where we are there are differences not only in terms of culture and religions but also um uh, beliefs and knowledge as well so we appreciate diversities and at the end of the day the global citizens should be a person that understand the technology trends meaning today's trends today technology might not be applicable for the next five or ten years um, forward so they do need to understand that there's a need to change so why there's the needs for lifelong lifelong learning in terms of creating global citizenships and the needs for uh, for having this transdisciplinary education is that we're always changing there's a rapidity of change in terms of this agile world that's that's why we call it agile because it's keep on changing from 1784 we have this industry 1.0 and today we have industry 4.0 and i would assume by five years forward five years from now we're going to have industry 5.0 Okay, so it's there's a rapid of change in terms of how um, the, the need of the skill itself, the demands of the skills, the demand of the knowledge itself. So we need to change ourselves and prepare for every change and adapt it. And then there's a change in global. Okay, lifelong learning is very important in terms of global competitiveness because everyone's again every country in the world they are competing with each other in a healthy manner in a healthy manner so we don't want to be left behind we don't want to be left behind so we need to create a lifelong learning platform where we can embrace the change for global competitiveness and it requires continuous refreshing of knowledge and tools and also the needs in terms of the changing world because nowadays the way we teach the way we learn are changing because of COVID-19 we change okay so therefore the world is keep on changing these two three years we might focus on um, learning because of pandemic but what happened in the next five to ten years they definitely have another next big things are going to happen to the world so we need to embrace the change of the world and knowledge is changing so fast that it's no longer possible to acquire them once and for all during the initial education so we ourselves need to upgrade our knowledge our knowledge for example what i've learned during the 1990s when i was just undergraduate will not be um suffice will not be enough for today's world because everything is changing the way how we protect the biodiversity the way how we manage how we manage our natural resources is also changing uh, adaptation is required okay so that we can apply them and of course change is disruptive <laughs> What oh, change is disruptive? Suddenly, change is disruptive. I was talking about change. You need to change. You need to adapt. But then I talk about change is disruptive. Yes, change is dis disruptive because the technology itself is dis is disruptive. Okay. So, for example, if you're buying a mobile phone in 1990s, I think it's during the early eight, uh, late uh, 1980s and early 1990s, we are using Nokia 3310 but then if you are still using nokia 3310 today <laughs> you might you know you might um be left left out because everyone is into TikTok, into instagram into social media so change is disruptive you need to embrace the change the the technology itself because disruptive technology uh, is creating a new market that kills the current one so at least we recognize the trend of disruptive technology. It will give you a sign, an early sign, uh, an, an early warning so that you, you need to be prepared for the 
change. So change needed lifelong learning. So when we talk about academia versus real world, we are actually trying our best to bridge the gap be, uh, between the valley of death and the real world. Okay, this is, the, this is a very sad story with academia actually. Usually we do our research, we share our research among ourselves, okay, among academia, with academia, and academia with researchers, that's all. Nothing's going out to share with the community, with the society. So I guess this is the best, uh, the best things that we need to, you know, to change our mindset is that academia need to share everyone uh, with the society because everything is um, relevant nowadays in terms of graduate employability. If we cannot create graduates that meet the demands of the industry, we are known as the universities of Valley of Death. <laughs> okay, so therefore, transdisciplinary education is very much important in the real world. Our today's practice to education is really inadequate. Okay, going through traditional universities in a single discipline is not a current trend nowadays okay and then studying with the local peers during a fix of four years is not going to transform a person to become a global citizen so i always always um ask uh, request my students to go out go out from malaysia go to japan go to korea go to thailand philippines everywhere as long as it's not malaysia embrace the new culture, embrace the diversity and come back with a new person, with a new mindset, because with, with that experience, we'll definitely create a global citizen's mindset. So when you are discussing an issues about, for example, SDG 14, life below water, and you're discussing it with your peers, your local peers, for almost two year, uh, uh, two hours of discussion and sharing, but you're only discussing and sharing about the situation, the issues, the challenges in Malaysia locally. But if you are embracing diversity, embracing a different um, issues, global issues, you definitely will open up a new spectrum of the way we're thinking on the way of how we manage, uh, how we manage the um, marine resources. So I guess we need to bridge the valley of death. And then in terms of nature of cross-border issues, this is, uh, this is basically interconnected with SDGs Seven, the, those 17 SDGs. Transdisciplinary education nowadays are simply, uh, you, you can just, you know, mix match it with the, uh, the 17 SDGs. It is highly interconnected. So no longer single disciplinary. We need to be multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary, and becoming a transdisciplinary itself after that. Because every issues, whether it is about inclusivity, gender equality, um, natural resources, or even um, education, everything is interconnected with each other. It's highly interconnected, just like these 17 SDGs. And then it is very, very impossible to talk about any one of the SDGs here that, that, you know, when we talk about no poverty, everything is connected with you know resources how to manage resources so everyone can gain alternative livelihood so everything is interconnected to become a global citizen you need to be highly interconnected and how to be highly interconnected become a transdisciplinary person not only talking about the learning or the knowledge that you gain from the universities but get involved with the industry itself and how do we prepare ourselves, um, you know, the, as a global citizens through transdisciplinary education? Is what, like I said earlier, we need to become just like the seventeen SDGs, highly interconnected with each other. Single disciplinary is no longer working here in in today's world. Multidisciplinary, yes, but 
still multi, it still depends on single disciplinary but it's multiple it's just that we add in um additional disciplinary and then when we add in you know at extra disciplinary it's just the same old goal except that there's another different disciplinary approach then we have the participatory approach where okay we have this academic and non-academic participants so we discuss and knowledge exchange is occurring but that's it okay we're not you're not yet creating a global citizen because the participatory is just among academic and non-academic participant and this this occur only exchange of knowledge not sharing not looking at the common common goal setting and then after that we have interdisciplinary it crosses disciplinary we have people from the social science and then we have people from science people from the economy talking about knowledge but then it just a development of an integrated knowledge approach we are talking about transdisciplinary today because transdisciplinary not only crosses disciplinary but also sectorial boundaries so meaning to say we have our industry partners together with us helping us to create a curriculum that fit in to the industry wants and demands so that when our graduates graduate they have job they have employer they the uh, the graduate employability will definitely increase because we are actually developing an, a common goal setting and develop integrated knowledge for science and the society itself so transdisciplinary is the today trending on how we need to, you know, um, become excellence in the global arena. When we talk about global arena, we talk about global education. Why is it so important to have global education? Why not just focus on Malaysia issues, Malaysia education? Because we want to create a global citizen with a global mindset that embrace all the diversities, the differences in everyone. So therefore, I would suggest global education is very important and we need to instill it in our students because it's socially important because we are we are ourselves is the great melting pot. We are come we come from from different background, cultures, religious and beliefs. And some of, of us are mixed marriages. So we are ourself is a great melting pot and we need to have a cultural respect and awareness reinforces core character values meaning to say nowadays we all we always hear about this this country is having massacre because of the political unrest and then war we need to forget about the differences we need to reinforce us on our core characters values that is respects and then trust love peace and harmony and then the economic importance as well because we are looking into global industries we are preparing ourselves into global industries because we need to compete with the global arena we cannot just you know uh, stay in the situation in, in the, what we say in the comfort zone no to strive to be excellence you need to compete in the global arena so that when you can compete with the global arena you are actually global uh, global champions and you need the global interdependence because all the economics whether other economics or education or anything are global interdependence with each other for example in buying exporting cars in, uh, importing cars we need other investment other other investors to invest in our product isn't it so we are actually global independence and of course definitely educational importance because we need to create an understanding of the differences through education empathy create instill empathy to our students to our society internationally competent citizens where if you throw our students to japan they quickly can adapt or we throw our, or we throw our students to Thailand. They can completely adapt to the to the different situation in Thailand. So we want to have our students, our as a competent citizen internationally, developing skills of cooperation, shared responsibility, critical thinking, and communication. Okay, how are we going to create this? 
there's a sixth uh, learning approach where you, we can actually create a global education to our students. We teach them about sustainable future, how to become sustainable, how to be excellent, how to be, you know, um, striving in this agile world. So we need to teach them about sustainability in terms of, you know, employability and how the way their life should be. Peace buildings and conflict. We need also to teach about them about not necessarily all about the good things, but also the conflicts, the issues that facing our earth the the global world the global agendas so they do need to understand the conflicts issues challenges that's happening whether it is bad or not they need to understand and from that situation they need to think what can they contribute to minimize the conflicts gaps and then social justice and human rights dimensions of change they need to understand that this world is agile, needed to be changed. So they need to know how to become a change and adapt and evolve persons. We are one world. Uh, this is like a motto of the Malaysia airline. Pula. It's like one world. <laughs> Why one world? Because we are globalization and interdependence with each other. Without other countries, without our friends from around the world, we are nothing. We cannot compete even in the economic arena. Okay, identity and cultural diversity, embracing the differences. And then how we, you know, learning. What are the global learning pathways? Of course, definitely we need to change the way we teach our students academically. Globally oriented capstones, projects, theses, and dissertations. We try to embedded the situation, global situation and conflicts in our, uh, you know, teaching, approaching, uh, approach in our learning and teaching session. Study abroad and away. Yes, go out, go for mobility program, go for exchange program, because if you're not going out, you cannot see what is happening around you, because you are now at your comfort zone. Go out and reach other people through mobility or exchange program globalized courses and collaboration this is what we are currently doing because because of the pandemic we are currently doing it more okay globalized courses we sharing courses sharing knowledge with expertise from around the around the globe and we do collaborations virtually and then of course experiences community engaged service learning yeah, the, like the universities uh usr university service uh, to, uh responsibility usr so it's 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 kind of like the sulam program how universities can contribute to the community to the society let our students go out hands on okay let them know what is happening around them Global research, internships, externship, externship meaning you go out lah. I get this a new word lah because we always use internship, right? Internship is like um, industrial training, insight. So externship, go out and do internship, um, you know, other places, other countries, and traineeship, living and leading global living and learning communities. We you need we need to create. Uh, students with the sustainability mindset okay they need to embrace the 17 sdgs and the way how they live okay how they learn okay campus program and clubs also need to let these young leaders lead okay the campuses program and clubs global learning events and activities get in touch with our friends and colleagues around the world and do activities and engaging uh, in engagement with them and then what are the global learning outcome if we are uh, doing the global learning approach that uh, earlier that i've mentioned definitely we can have global awareness global diversity and global actions we're creating an awareness among our students analyzing how the context system this is is going on and what and how this context system in this agile world impacting themselves and others and then we em embrace uh, inclusivity, different, different cultures, diversities. And of course, global action is the most important one is that we can create strategies to apply how the students can apply the knowledge and skills to the society. Let's talk about ASEAN. 
Okay, when we talk about global education, transdisciplinary education, global citizen, it's very huge, but let's just focus on ASEAN. ASEAN has just become community, ASEAN community in 2015. And this is because of the growing concerns of the global competition. You see, global competition is very important. Okay, global competitiveness is very important in the global market. So ASEAN, if, if it stand alone as a country, definitely it's, it's very hard to compete globally. So therefore, as, as a community, as an ASEAN community, we can actually collaborate uh, together and creating an extraordinary results uh, to compete in the global market in the, or the global economy. Because I do believe ASEAN as together, as one entity can become very strong and create impacts. When we talk about ASEAN higher education, we have actually, uh, ASEAN is, is uh, actually is very, very into the education system. They, they, they think that to create difference in terms of global competitiveness, whether it is in the economic arena, education is important. So therefore, ASEAN have come up with a five-year working plan on education, 2011 until 2015, and that focuses on effective education for all ASEAN community, uh, cross-border mobility and internalizations of education. And then the subsequent uh, work plan continue because they, they think that we need to embrace global citizenship through the eye of ASEAN. So therefore, they have another eight sub goals coming out from the subsequent work plan 2016 until 2020. And because of the importance of transdisciplinary education, global education and global citizen nowadays, ASEAN came up with a master plan on ASEAN community, uh, ASEAN connectivity, MPEC for 2025. And then under this MPEC 2025, it focuses more on the physical, institutional, and people-to-people -people linkages. Uh, also contains an explicit uh, strategic objective that is to increase the number of intra-ASEAN international students. Why intra-ASEAN international mobility is very important? Because we do believe to become a global competitiveness um, through the eyes of ASEAN, we need to create, to develop the ASEAN culture uh, as in itself first, before we go for the global arena. Because why? Because here ASEAN itself, we are divided based on our different stages of development. For CLNV, for example, Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, and Vietnam, their higher education is mostly uh, looking into or focusing into the national policies to reform and system expansion. Meaning to say, they because they are still developing, they need to increase the enrollment and infrastructure development first. Okay, and then how do we need? Uh, um, that therefore, why ASEAN MPEC 2025 is very important is that so that we can help and support our ASEAN family uh, under the CLNV. And then, of course, we have the middle income nations like Malaysia, Thailand, Indonesia, and Philippines. We have different focuses, of course, from the CLNV countries, whereas our higher education system is more on the enhancements of the quality of higher education. And then, of course, we can see that Malaysia have already moved to the next level in a number of ways in terms of improvement of higher education. And then, of course, we have the third category is the high income countries, such as the Singapore and Brunei, especially Singapore, they are more on the globally oriented uh, where they have more well-developed higher education system as compared to other countries in the ASEAN community. So therefore we need each other. We need each other to support um, all these developing and underdeveloped countries in the ASEAN community so that we can strive and stand together as an ASEAN community. And for AIMS, from the eyes of ASEAN International Mobility for Students, we do understand the importance of internalization and globalization. Globalization is to go local but global because we do believe 
global education is very important. Therefore, we embrace it through 10 disciplines under the ASEAN International Mobility for Students. We have 10 different disciplines where each of these disciplines can actually can do transdisciplinary education, meaning to say we do have also students coming from the background of engineering. With, uh, they don't care about credit transfer, but they want to learn about the issues in agriculture. So they participate in the agriculture discipline because they embrace the global citizenship. Under the AIMS, AIMS uh, ASEAN International Mobility, we have 78 participating universities across nine member countries. Two yes. more minutes, please. Okay, don't worry. Be happy. <laughs> Almost finished. <laughs> okay, under the AMS Malaysia, we started um, as early as 2010. Um, as MIT, Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand, with six uh, public universities. And then after the successful of global education through ASEAN International Mobility for Students program, so we evolved into ASEAN first. And then because of more countries participating in, so we changed from ASEAN to Asian. And now for AIMS Malaysia, from six public universities, now we have 10 uh, public universities participating under the AIMS Malaysia. So they, we do believe that global education is very much important in AIMS Malaysia. So these are some of the activities that looking into transdisciplinary education through AIMS program. Because we do believe to have a diff, uh, to have a, a students with a global mindset, we need to create a platform for them to adapt and change and learn. So these are some of the photos. And because we believe through AIMS Malaysia, we are actually creating young leaders of ASEAN with global citizen mindset. Go for ASEAN first, then the global arena. So before I end my talk today, I would like to share a very important um, quote from Martin Luther King Jr. That is, people fail to get along because they fear each other. Therefore, that's why we have wars. We have this political unrest because we, they are fear for each other. Why they fear each other? Because they don't know each other. They don't know each other because they have not communicated with each other. Therefore, I do believe global education is very much important and how to get global education is through transdisciplinary education. Before I end, you can click this link later because I don't have much time to talk more about it, about global education, transdiscipl transdisciplinary education, but you can click on this link to know more about how you can create global education through transdisciplinary education learning approach. With that, thank you very much. Terribly sorry, moderator. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> thank you so thank much, you. Dr. Kiki. I'm wary of time. That's why I reminded. But thank you so much for sharing. Okay. So what I got from here, in short, go for Asia. Don't go for global straight away. Go for Asia first. Embrace the fear. Nelson Mandela said, courage is not the absence of fear. So embrace the fear for globalization of education. Okay. We always complete our circle. Let's fly back to the land of the rising sun, Japan. Straight to a research intensive university founded in 1882, Waseda University, Tokyo. Our fourth panelist is from Waseda University, Professor Dr. Kenichi Namai. Hi, Gozaimas. This is still morning here in Malaysia. All right. Prof. Ken is a professor of linguistics at Waseda University. Um, he earned his PhD from the Department of Linguistics at Georgetown University in 1998. He has held visiting professorships at Indiana University, Purdue University, Indianapolis 2006, the National University of Singapore in 2017, and the National University of Malaysia from 2017 to 2018. His other current posts include a lecture of Japanese culture at the Japan International Cooperation Agency. He's a member of the board of directors of the Japan Association of Teaching Language and Culture. He's also an adjunct lecturer of English Linguistics at the Graduate School of Literature, Seijo University. He is the leading author of the Discovery English Communication Series and the New Discovery English Communication Series, as well as the brand new series, Ambition. These are all officiated, um, certified by the Ministry of Education, Culture, Sports, Science and Technology. Here with us, he will be speaking about the importance of transdisciplinary education. Please welcome Prof Ken. The floor is yours. Okay. Well, thank you very much, um, Dr. Adelina. 
Right. Um, first of all, I would like to say that I'm really grateful for this uh, opportunity. Um, I cannot believe that I'm doing this presentation with dignified people like Sugimura Sensei and uh, Dr. Fifi and now Dean Cairo. Okay, so let me uh, you know, share my screen with you. I hope that you guys can uh, yes. see my uh, yes. slides. Okay, so let me start my uh, slideshow. Um, how are we doing time-wise? Uh, we are okay. You have your 15 minutes. Okay, 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, something tells me that everybody must be very tired by now. So <laughs> I, know, um, I will make this uh, nice and short. Okay, and uh, the other uh, presenters talked about you know uh, general ideas, but today I want to uh, talk about something that is more concrete. I would like to give you one concrete example that shows the importance of transdisciplinary education. Okay. Would you like to slide share? What did you say? Would you like to share your slide? A slide slide share. Slide share. Uh huh. Uh, I don't quite understand what you're talking about. You know, okay. I mean, the, uh, oh, you are not seeing this? No, I can see it. We can see Thank it, you. but it's not uh, fully uh, in the screen. So if you it have is, to press the slide share button, have you done that? Okay, let's try that, let's try that again. Okay, so, yeah, let me Yeah, do it. okay. Uh, okay, all right. There we go. Okay, so uh, this was the first slide that you missed. Okay, and uh, this is the second slide. Now I don't have to uh, mention uh, SDGs, right? Because you know the other presenters you know, talked about SDGs. Now there are seventeen goals, and uh, my presentation today um, is some. I mean, has something to do with uh, these four goals: no poverty, and uh, quality education, and the reduced inequalities. Okay. Now one thing about these things. I mean, if you say that, that you want to uh, study, you know, subjects that are related to uh, those goals, okay, and what should you study, you know, and I think these are related to disciplines like sociology, education, and, uh, you know, subjects that are related to ODA, okay. Now, please notice that these are all uh, humanities courses. Okay, and the one thing about the SDGs is that you know I think somebody mentioned this, but you know, whatever you decide to do, you need to uh, make sure that uh, nobody is left behind. Okay, so please keep that in mind. Now I want to talk about deaf people here today. Okay, deaf education. You know how do we uh, educate the people who cannot hear? Right now, these people. Well, actually, you know, I would like to one ask you this question: Do you have deaf friends? Okay, I always ask this question, you know, when I teach my students, and most of the time, you know, my students say no. All right, so why is that? Well, deaf people are not visible. Okay, now probably, you know, even you guys don't know the difference between these two types of deaf people. No, notice that the first one, okay, this deaf, right? Um. It, it starts with this uh, small d, but the second one, you know, it's a capital D, okay? There is this, this distinction. Now, the first one, you know, this uh, def um, that starts with a small d, um, you know, this expression is about old people, okay? So these people, you know, and when they were younger, they didn't have any problems with their hearing, okay? But as they grow older and older, you know, they uh, start to lose the ability to hear. Okay, and uh, sometimes you know, they uh, lose the ability to hear completely. Okay, so now we are talking about these old deaf people. Now, deaf with this capital letter. Okay, now you can see here, right? Now these people are using sign language. You know, one thing about these people is that they are really unfortunate. You know, when they are born, they are born deaf. Okay, so uh, no spoken language input, you know, um, comes into their heads. Okay, so they don't know anything about spoken language. So they have to resort to something like a sign language to communicate with other people. So there is this uh, important distinction. But my point is, you know, not many people know this difference. Okay, this is one point, right? Now, why is that? You know, deaf people are invisible. Now, if they are invisible, 
Okay, sometimes bad things uh, happen to them. I would like to give you uh, two concrete examples here. Okay, do you remember this problem of AIDS? Okay, now yesterday I was shocked because when I was talking to uh, one of my students, you know, this student didn't know what AIDS was. Okay, now AIDS was a big problem back in the 1980s and uh, 1990s, I believe. Okay. Now, when AIDS was a big problem in the United States, I mean, you know that uh, America you know, has a lot of immigrants and these people don't know how to speak a word of English. They are sp still speaking their own languages. Okay, now American people know that. So what they did was, you know, um, actually doctors, okay, they wanted to uh, prepare something like a brochure, you know, and if you read this brochure, then you will know how to, uh, you know, prevent this problem of AIDS, okay? but you know american people totally forgot about uh you know people who use sign language all right so the information was translated into many languages but sign language was forgotten as a result you know many deaf people got the disease okay and they eventually died something similar happened uh to us you know japanese people also remember 10 years ago, you know, there was that big um, earthquake and uh, this big tsunami came and uh, it hit the uh, Tohoku region of Japan. Okay. Now, nothing was planned for the deaf people. As a result, uh, many deaf people died. All right. So we want to uh, help these people. Remember, you know, we want to make sure that nobody is left behind. But uh, now, you know, you understand that uh, most of the time deaf people are, you know, being uh left out okay so if you say that you want to help deaf people you know what kind of uh, subjects should you study in university you know chances are you come up with humanities courses okay now i would like to show you that uh, you know humanity courses only are never enough i mean you have to study um you know other scientific oriented um, subjects also all right now this is a true story you know that happened in the united states Okay, so it's kind of like a history of deaf education of the United States, okay? Now, by 1867, you know, there were 26 sign language schools, right? Now, America is a big country, okay? Now, there are more than, what, 5,000 uh, universities and colleges in America, okay? But here, we are talking about only 26 sign language schools. So this number is very small, okay? And yet, you know, and this was better than nothing. All right, so if you are lucky enough to go to one of these schools, and if you're deaf, you know, um, you didn't have to worry about anything because, you know, you were able to receive very good education in sign language. So all was going very well, okay? Now, here I'm talking about ASL, American Sign Language, you know, be, because see, we are talking about, I mean, I am talking about the United States. Now, do you remember this person, Alexander Graham Bell? All right, he's a very famous person, you know, he is the person who invented the telephone, okay? So he was a very influential person. And, uh, you know, when he was you know, really active, okay, he got together with uh, some other, other influential politicians, you know? And in, what, uh, 1870s, okay? Now these influential people started saying these things, you know, by educating the deaf in sign language, they were isolated from, from the hearing community. You know, so these people really wanted to, uh, you know, help deaf people. Okay, so they meant well. Now, what kind of conclusion did they come to? They are for the deaf should not be allowed to sign, but instead they should be taught to vocalize and to lip read. Okay, so as long as deaf people are using sign language, you know, they can never, you know, mingle with uh, the hearing community. You know, they, they, these guys, uh, people like Bell wanted to uh, include deaf people within, you know, the so-called mainstream society, right? So deaf people should be taught how to vocalize and to lip read. All right. Now, because of the fact that these people are so influential, what happened after that was, you know, there was this um, International Congress of Educators, okay? And this took place in, uh, in Milan, Italy. And these guys, you know, condemned the use of sign in deaf classrooms. As a result, oral schools sprang up in the Western world, okay? So if you go to an oral school, you know, everything is done in spoken language. All right, so think about it. You know, you are deaf, you know, you cannot hear anything. 
but now you have to go to an oral store. All right. Now, by 1907, okay, there were 197 schools for the deaf in the United States, and none of them used ASL. All right. In oral schools, the children spent years just trying to learn to vocalize and lip read. Okay, failure, you know, oralism failed miserably. All right, now, um, during the 1950s, uh, here I'm talking about the graduates of the Hartford Asylum. Now, what kind of place is this? It's the first institution of higher learning, specifically for the deaf and the blind. Okay, so now I'm not, not talking about high school. Okay, now this is kind of like a university. Actually, Hartford Asylum, you know, uh, developed into a Gallaudet University in Washington, D.C. And this is the biggest and the most comprehensive uh, university for, you know, sign language education in the world. Okay, but, you know, if you are lucky enough to uh, go to this asylum, you know, during the 1950s, all right, um, you are as literate as, you know, the hearing population. Okay, now let's go back to ordinary deaf people. By 1972, the average reading level of the 18 year old deaf high school graduates in the United States was at the fourth grade level. Remember at the beginning, you know, these deaf people were able to receive education, quality education in sign language, you know, and they were as literate as the hearing population. But now, Okay, now this is the result, you know, their level is, you know, that of uh, fourth grade uh, children, okay? Now, if you don't know spoken language, so, you know, I want you to uh, use your imagination, okay? How would you learn to produce spoken language sounds, all right? Right from the beginning, you have never experienced a spoken language, you know, so you don't know how to produce a spoken language sounds. Okay, so if you want to educate these people, you know, if you want to teach these people how to uh, pronounce spoken language sounds, you have to have a lot of um, you know, knowledge from the field of, for example, biology. Now, this is, uh, you know, maybe human anatomy. And if you study, you know, something like uh, phonetics, you know, you will encounter a picture like this. Okay, now this blue part is called the vocal organ. Okay, and there are these different uh, parts. Okay, and all these uh, different parts are called, I mean, technically they are called uh, articulators, you know, by manipulating all these different parts within the vocal organ, and we produce a lot of different human sounds, I mean, uh, human language sounds, okay? But you have to have this kind of knowledge, but, you know, people like, you know, Bell, okay, they didn't have this kind of knowledge whatsoever, okay? Now let's go to um, perception or comprehension, lip reading. Okay, have you uh, tried this before? No, let me give you one exercise here. Pat, bat, mat. Okay, now since you are hearing people, you know, when I pro pronounce these words, okay, you actually hear what I am you know, producing. Okay, you know that these are the three words are different words. Okay, but imagine that you cannot hear anything. You know, the only information that you have is, okay, my face, you know, my, uh, my lips are moving. Okay, now when I produce these three sounds, you know, you see exactly the same thing. Okay, pat, bat, mat, right? Now, I would like to give you a mission. My mission is very simple. Plug your ears and go to Thailand and learn to speak Thai. Okay, you have to use very good earplugs, you know? Now, when you put on these earplugs, no sound whatsoever, you know, comes into your head. Okay, and you go to Thailand and learn how to speak Thai. You know, can you do it? Okay, think about it. You know, now people like Bell meant well, and the other day didn't have this kind of knowledge. Okay, so uh, they were forcing their people to do this kind of mission. All right. Now, the importance of a transdisciplinary education is obvious, right? So if you only study humanities and subjects, you know, I don't think that you can find any ways, any good ways to help the people, you know? Now, in order to fully understand my presentation, you have to have some knowledge of linguistics. Okay, actually this kind of linguistics, you know, is part of cognitive science, okay? And the cog some people say that the cognitive science is a part of biology. Right, so you have to have 
you know, knowledge from all these different scientific fields, you know, otherwise you can never come up with any, uh, you know, um, effective way of helping deaf people, okay? Now, if you're interested in the kind of thing that I talked about here today, you know, there is this very important work, you know, Language Matters by Donna Joan Napoli. Okay, so uh, I strongly recommend that you find this book and read it, and uh, Napoli will blow your mind. Okay, um, that's all for my uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. All right. Ken Sensei reminded us of inclusivity as we move forward in transdisciplinary education and global citizenship. And we also need to reminisce the past and include gems from the past into our understanding of um, trans transdisciplinary education and global citizenship. Arigato gozaimasu, um, Professor Ken. All right, we will take questions right now. Okay, I have with me one question here. Okay. This is directed to Prof. Miki from Gabriel Archimedes Flores. I love his name, Archimedes Flores. Okay. Japanese education is sometimes described as taking place in a homogeneous uh, culture. Could you tell us your assessment or perhaps your observation of transdisciplinary education practice in Japanese education system? That's one. And the learning frameworks that you employ to overcome issues and challenges in the aforementioned culture description. Thank you. Two questions from Gabriel. Thank you very much for good questions. Yeah, actually, yes, as you know, in Japan is still very homogeneous, a kind of homogeneous society, and we are still struggling how we can overcome this uh, more narrow-minded, uh, sometimes a prejudice or something. But I think maybe transdisciplinary learning and more innovative learning have a lot of opportunities to make the learners I open more with a different perspective. For example, now the Ken Sensei from Waseda University introduced one very concrete example, how we can uh, make the students eye opens, how we can think of the inclusiveness or how we can think about equity and those concepts. This is a very, very complicated concept, but the students can learn uh, how to create those concepts from not only their perspective, but also another perspective. So these uh, trial are very important to our now Japanese society. Uh, still, some people very uh, kind of conservative, but the mindset should be very important through the transdisciplinary learning. So it's plain work, as the questioner already mentioned it, the scheme change and uh, arose uh, mindset of learners and not only for younger generation, even on the older generation, aging people should be come to be uh, people uh, for their lifelong learning. Yeah, so thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Miki Sensei. All right, second question. Um, would anybody like to comment on uh, Gabriel's question? Nobody else? Okay, let's go on to the next question. This is for Prof Kairu from Gabriel again, Archimedes Flores. Okay. Uh, this is a very complex question, yeah, but very interesting one. A transdisciplinary education driven by self-directed, community-based, research-based experiential learning is definitely a game changer. Definitely a game changer. Okay. So which UKM learning model best embodies this approach? And this is the complex question, yeah. How is it producing global citizens in a world sometimes agitated by religious? political and economic hegemony. Oh. <laughs> I know. Thank you very much, says Gabriel. Prof. Cairo? Thank you for that question, uh, Gabriel. I'm not sure whether I can answer you to your satisfaction. Um, but um, the one, the first question is about the, the transdisciplinary education implemented at UKM. Is that yeah. The yeah, which, board, which model best embody this approach? Which model best embody? Uh, it depends. You mentioned self-directed, community-based, research-based experiential learning. It is a combination of all. It is a combination of all because um, students being the young generation, of course, they have 
uh, creativity in their ideas. They want to know more and they can, do, they want to do more, but somehow we have to guide them appropriately because of um, the young need some of guidance. So uh, in our program, we have a so-called um, committee, advisory committee, and the program committee, which uh, uh, comprises of uh, the educators, the academician, uh, the stakeholders, the, the industry representative, and the student themselves. So the student would be in, a, in, the, in that committee as a student whereby we as the academician and also the industry partners would advise the student. Uh, let's say if, if, uh, if the student wanted to be someone who are interested in the agricultural economics or um, digital animation, for example. So we know the best uh, courses that he or she should enroll. So this is where we guide students to make the right choice of their courses at the university. And uh, the, the opportunities that uh, in front of him or her in the in, in outside campus, in, in the real world. So, so actually, uh, there is no one single model that can be uh, said effective for the, uh, this kind of program. We actually embrace and, and welcome different uh, combination of the model, self-directed as well as the field-based or work-based learning. So, so that's, that's how we, we think of. Because uh, as you know, our Bachelor of Liberal Studies has just, uh, is, is still in infancy. We have our three cohorts already, but uh, next year would be our first graduate uh, to, to, to complete the study, to complete the program. So we are not yet sure uh, uh, what's the output. Anyway, uh, uh, the, the model that we use is actually a combination of all. Thank you very much, Prof. Cairo. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to jump to Dr. Fifi. Would you like to answer that particular question? How do we produce global citizens in a world sometimes agitated by religious, political, and economic hegemony? Because you are the executive secretary of AIMS Malaysia. So, so would, you like, to, would you like to? Would you like to? Would you like to? <laughs> would you like to? Thank you, Madam Moderator. So this is basically based on my past experience um, myself when I went to Keynes to study my PhD. I was one, the one and only in that particular airport who is wearing a uh, hijab. So nobody else. So they have, I, I, they have this dogs and police officers surrounded me during that time and you know and then uh, smell my 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 son's um punya baju uh, the, the 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 clothes everything so because during that time we are having this 911 situations where the bombing of this uh, during the 911 situation so everyone who is wearing hijab or having this long beard, they will inspect it very carefully. So therefore, I was thinking about why the reason that everyone will, will, will have that, that kind of thoughts. So I was thinking about probably because of like what um, the quote saying in, in my slide, that they don't understand us. They don't know us, therefore they, they, uh, we don't have communication with them that they don't believe in us, they don't have the trust in us. So they have the skeptical in mind. Okay, so I would, I, I would suggest that if we want to, to send our students, okay, we, want, we need to equip them. We need to equip, equip them with all the necessary information, okay, information about what are uh, what is the what is happening around us in the world embrace the conflicts embrace the issues embrace the differences educate them so that when they go out they don't feel suddenly scared because of the differences okay they need to accept the differences they need to listen and see more 
uh, to understand why the situation is like that. Okay, because I've learned about 9-11, I know the situations about during that time. So I didn't jump into conclusion. I didn't jump into conclusion and I stay calm and I just let them do what they need to do. So that when we feel calm, we do understand what is happening. We will, we will definitely, you know, at ease. So I would suggest that who, if we want to send our students to go out, uh, for example, exchange program or mobility program, we need to educate, we need to educate them, not only the disciplinary that they need to know, about what they're learning at school, but also those who are unrelated with the educational uh, curriculum. Uh, yeah, for example, social, surrounding, social yeah. science surrounding, what is, uh, what is happening around us? They need to update themselves. So for, for, for me, it is very important to let our students to experience this kind of problem so that when they come back, they have a global mindset that they do understand what is happening around them. So when okay. they talk to other peers, local peers, they will share the experience. They know what to tell them and they know how to teach with their peers. So that when their peers, some, some, someday we go out and experience the same situation as them, they will embrace it. You know, they will embrace it and take it into what I said, in, in a calm manner. That, 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 that is what I, I think. <laughs> Thank, Thank you very you. much, Dr. Fifi, for <laughs> embracing that question, that complex question. Okay, there's a question from Mikiko Sugiura for uh, Miki Sensei. Uh, thank you very much for introducing the transdisciplinary approach, which plays an important role in the transformation from knowledge base to creative base. Um, is, is there anything that we should pay attention to in order to take a positive view of the pandemic situation? and develop a transdisciplinary approach through COIL. So it's more pandemic situation. Yeah, thank you very much again. A very, very good question. And if we focus on the COIL, collaborative online international learning and virtual education, we need to consider some points because there are several discussion how this COIL have a good point and bad point. Because today I already introduced a good point, but the, some minor point is we need the kind of this kind of the equipment or sometime an, an equally uh, situation can raise uh, more social differences when the students join this virtual and coil project. So when we try to attract more the coil uh, project or a program, we need to think about what kind of each local context should be uh, created in this kind of uh, program. And another point, also this point might be related to the another presenters uh, point out, uh, maybe uh, now the SDGs go focus on the inclusion equity, not only equality, but equity should be very important concept. Equality, of course, we have a lot of discussion on the equality and we can give the equal opportunity to all the learners, even in the developing countries or in the developed countries. But nowadays, all over the world, people have struggling with this very complicated COVID situation at the same time. And we can feel at the same time how we can try to create a more good program or learning situation in order to no one left behind. So that's the point. So not only just to give the opportunity, how we can think about the result or learning outcome uh, should be qualified in each local context. I think this is a very, very important but complicated issues which the educational science is now facing on. So of course we can create the program first, but not only just creating, we try to focus on the more the quality assurance issues. Yeah, that's my uh, current uh, view. Yeah, thank you very much for being Thank questions. you very much, thank Miki you. Sensei. Okay, we'll take one last question here. This is for Ken Sensei. Okay, there's this debate between the needs for specialized experts versus transdisciplinary experts. So we have specialized and transdisciplinary graduates. And this debate has been ongoing. Which is more important in growing global citizens? Both. <laughs> yeah, the answer is very, very easy. It's, it's both. But I would like to say something about, you know, uh, some of the previous questions. 
Okay, so if you want to send your students to foreign countries, you know, there is one message that you should give to these people, right? Now, I think this is very important, okay? Now, you are going into a new culture, right? Now, when it comes to culture, you can never use this word, bad, okay? It's just different, right? Now, this is something that we have to know, I mean, before we visit any other foreign countries, right? So. Every time I go to a foreign country, I always tell myself you know, not to use any negative words. Okay, I am going to experience something that is very different, right? Because I'm going to a different country. Now, if I say, okay, so this thing is different, so I think that this country is bad. I mean, if I have that kind of uh, you know, attitude, maybe I, you know, I should stay within Japan. I mean, I shouldn't go out, right? So this is something that everybody has to know. You know, you shouldn't use any negative words, okay? The other thing is, you know, this uh, coil thing, you know, uh, inter I mean, if you use the internet, you know, you don't have to be, you know, at, um, at the campus of a university or anything, right? I mean, you can participate in any, uh, you know, so-called quality education uh, classes, okay? I always have this problem. I have always had this problem. Evaluation, what should we do? Okay, because I mean, you don't know um, see, and what all the participants are doing. I mean, if you want to give them quiz, uh, quiz or maybe, you know, you give them um, examination or something. Okay, now, how do you know that, uh, you know, this um, student is actually the one who is, you know, answering all the questions, I mean, who is writing all the essays? You know, there are, the, I don't know which, uh, what I should use, some, uh, cunning people okay now these guys what they do is you know they ask other people to write essays for them and uh, this is what they uh, submit you know is there a way to control this kind of thing you know so i've have always had this uh question and uh i have spoken to uh, some of my uh, colleagues but uh, nobody has been able to uh, give me a very good answer you know i still don't know what to do Okay, no, I think I, uh, I have spoken enough. So. Okay, thank, you very, thank you very much for the insight, all of you. Um, we, there will be another webinar by UKM Global in October 2021. They will take more questions. There will be more discussions, interesting questions on internationalization and higher education. Um, today, we now, um, we have layered understanding of uh, transdisciplinary education and the connections it has with the context of the past, um, curriculum, uh, inquiry on global citizenship as well. So I thank all panelists um, for the lovely sharing today uh, for the UKM webinar series. Um, uh, for everybody to keep an eye out for the next webinar in October 2021. If those, uh, I understand that some questions are to do with interested to partner they're interested to partner with all of you. So those interested to partner with uh, UKM Global or the panelists or beyond, please uh, visit their website, UKM Global or website. Uh, they've got um, uh, links there for you to contact uh, the people over there. So thank you, UKM Global. Thank you, Toshiba International Foundation for realizing today's webinar. Um, before I hand over uh, the floor to Harfis, the MC, remember what Socrates said. Um, I am not the citizen of Athens or Greece. I am the citizen of the world. And Ken Sensei said, nothing is bad. Things are just different. So with that, I thank you everybody and have a blessed rest of the week. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullah. Over to you, Hafiz. Can I have a word? Just, oh, sure, Prof. Yeah. Of course. I just want to uh, make an announcement that our School of Liberal Studies is organizing an international uh, liberal Studies uh, Conference to, starting from tomorrow, uh, uh, two days, tomorrow and the day after. You are very much welcome to join us. Uh, 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 just with, open up the website at the Chitra, uh, Pusat Pengajian Chitra UKM or School of Liberal Studies UKM on our website. So you are, much, uh, you are all of you are welcome. Thank you. Thank you. So again, thank you, Prof. Miki, Prof. Ken, Prof. Cairo, Dr. Fifi for a lovely session. Bye. See you next time. Bye-bye. Thank Bye. you very much. Welcome. You. Hafiz, over Thank to you. you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, as I said, Professor Dr. Adena Asmawi for successfully moderating the 
uh, the sessions earlier today. Yes, uh, thank you so much to all our distinguished panelists for such an inspiring uh, session. That was a great sharing of best practices from every one of you here. Well, I hope that uh, this sharing has enlightened us all uh, on transdisciplinary education and, of course, the valuable, uh, you know, the valuable input shared by our panelists its benefits to the growth of us as a global citizens. Yes, I also would like to acknowledge the presence of our Deputy Vice Chancellor of Student Affairs here, Professor Dato Dr. Insinio Osman A. Karim. Yeah, he's with us joining. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are almost approaching to the end of our webinar today. On behalf of the organizer, we would like to thank the panelists again today for their cooperation in realizing today's event. Yes, of course, for our friends internationally in Japan, arigato gozaimasu. For our friends in the Philippines, maraming salamat. And for all other ASEAN, um, you know, friends, terima uh, kasih. Thank you very much. And of course, representative and also the technical team from the Faculty of Medicine, University Kebangsaan. Uh, Malaysia for the technical support. Thank you very much ag again. Yes, importantly, and I hope that I will not forget this. Thank you so much to Toshiba International Foundation for this, you know, for supporting this event. Yeah, thank you so much. And we hope to continue this more in the future. All right. All in all, thank you very much. Terima kasih. Till we meet again in our future webinars. Kindly, I would like to uh, ask our participants here. We are more. We have more than 250 over participants um, uh, witnessing this event this morning. Please uh, go to our, you know, our uh, our chat box. There's a feedback uh, attending uh, for the attendance uh, before exiting, because we're going to, you know, send you a certificates of attendance, and of course. For those watching live streaming via Facebook, the link for the feedback form will also be shared soon. Once again, thank you so much for your time and we hope to see you again. And also don't forget the conference iCitra tomorrow, the 29th and the 30th. You, everyone here are welcome to, to join. Thank you so much. Again, terima kasih. Thank you very much. Maraming salamat. Thank you.